Addy soldiers, I don't have a script for this video, so we're just gonna wing it and hope that I've had enough caffeine this morning to be funny. Oh, you can't even really see the graphic. Okay, look, look how freaking cute this is, all right? Spooky season is right around the corner and I'm going full steam ahead. As is evident, I am a great lover of fantasy books, but something else I am is tired. I grossly overbooked myself and have absolutely no time to do anything this month, including to read all these 800 plus page fantasy novels because now if you want a good fantasy you have to read like a thousand pages and like Samantha Shannon I blame you. This is why I haven't read books like Forging Silver Into Stars or The Spear Cuts Through Water or don't even get me started on When the Moon Hatched. Girl she's a brick. Because while I may be a bit of a size queen when it comes to books, Sometimes I just can't be bothered. Like I look at this and I'm instantly exhausted. And then as you're getting advertised all these new giant fantasy novels, oh, knock, knock, what's that? It's your Goodreads goal telling you that you're behind schedule. So then you know you should be reading more, but you can't decide what to pick and everything is so big and all the stress compiles and then bam, you're in a certified reading slump and the world's falling apart. If this is you, have no fear because welcome to today's video where we're gonna talk about my top 10 fantasy novels that are under 300 pages. And they won't just be novellas, mostly because A, uh, I, you know, everyone talks about novellas as ways to get out of reading slumps, and B, I had a um, certain prejudice against novellas until fairly recently, so I haven't read a ton. I'm also not going to be talking about YA or graphic novels, which are great ways to read something quickly, but I want to focus on like adult fantasy stuff today. So without further ado, grab a drink, grab a snack, and buckle in. Let's talk about 10 compact and considerate fantasy novels that are all under 300 pages. And even though it will sort of depend on what format that you purchase, hardcover, softcover, mass market paperback, ebook, they're gonna have a different page count. But the first one I want to talk about sneaks in at 288 pages, and it's one of my favorite fantasy novels of all time, regardless of it being short, and that is God Kill by Hannah Kanner. God, I love a fucked up deer. Set in the aftermath of a war between gods and men, our main character Kissin is a god killer who one day stumbles across a small god that she cannot kill and the young noble woman that he is pledged to. Joined by a disillusioned knight, the four of them all travel to the last standing city of wild gods all to beg a favor as it looks like a once thought dead god is rising once again. There's action, adventure, found family, cult stuff, and what it means to have blind faith in something. There's amazing representation in here for physical disabilities, mental disorders, autism, we have a character who's blind, a character who's a sign language, a character who's in a wheelchair. Kissin herself is an amputee, she doesn't have a leg from a god-killing session gone wrong, and Elagast has PTSD that resolves in tremors. Inara is the young noblewoman that the grumpy Kissin reluctantly is chaperoning to this city, and she's like a preteen age, it's a bit of a coming into yourself narrative, but also this kind of naivete being shattered and having to grow up too fast. And she is bound to Skediseth, aka Skeddy, who is this little wild jackalope god of white lies. I also love jackalopes. I have a jackalope tattoo. Skeddy is my absolute favorite character. God Killer tackles war and worship along with a cast of characters that are delightfully flawed. And I gotta say the sequel, Sunbringer, the blue one right there was even better. And I think that one's also under 300 pages. So you should get on this. Hold on, quick fact check. This one comes in at, oh, 365. My next video is gonna be best books under 400 pages. Ooh, what's next? Should we do a gothic? Like, who doesn't love a good gothic? Clocking in at 292 pages with acknowledgements, it is Last Tale of the Flower Bride by Roshni Chakshi. This is dark, decadent, and dazzling with one of my personal favorite tropes, which is Cool House. Our main character is a man who is never named. He's only ever referred to as the bridegroom, and he marries a mysterious but beautiful heiress named Indigo. The only rule she has for her paramour is that he never asks about her past. But when the two of them go to her child home when her grandmother is dying. He starts learning more and more about the family and this best friend that she had when she was a child who went missing. The house itself seems to be speaking to him as Indigo grows more and more erratic, all coming together in a modern wicked fairy tale about secrets, love, and betrayal. It's all whispering houses and rituals made flesh and shadows that look wrong. It balances this kind of macabre whimsy of a fairy tale while also having this twisted influence of modernity. With Indigo we get flashbacks of her as a child with her best friend Azure as they start to grow in their magic and the weird twisted magic that this house affords them. And it's not that I love a haunted house, like I am an absolute coward when it comes to corn mazes, haunted houses, any kind of scary attraction. I hate it. I don't like being scared. But the fact that this is less than 300 pages of just pure 
pure unsettlement is a testament of how amazing her writing is in this because I am ready to move into this weird gothic Victorian house with a beautiful attic that will open doors for you and rearrange furniture in the dead of night and change the paintings on the walls at a whim. Like, you have to give a little blood to it. To not have to deal with an HOA might be something I would do. Oh, sick. I just got an email saying that I'm gonna receive a refund for a uh, strata levy that I had to pay a little while ago. That's nice. Okay. Okay, strata. Maybe... Maybe I owe you some blood after all. Thirdly is the first of two actual novellas on this list, and it's one that I just finished, and I have a lot of feelings towards it, and that is The Deep by River Sullivan. This is a beautifully written and deeply thought-provoking, no pun intended, addition to the Afrofuturism canon that stars Yetu, who is a member of the Wajinru, which are deep-sea mer people that are the descendants of the babies that were born from women who were thrown off of slave ships. History and memory are very important for these people, and Yetu herself is the memory keeper. She is the historian for her race, because Wajinru, they don't keep their memories for very long, so they need one person in their community that holds all of the collective memories of the society for like over 600 years. But in keeping these memories in, it is slowly killing Yetu. And during a ritual, she escapes and accidentally gets herself stranded on a beach and then has to deal with a world that her ancestors left behind while also dealing uh, and understanding the responsibility that she has to her people. There's a lot in here on what it's like being a like kind of semi-religious figure in your community while also being young. The pressure of having to live up to your community's expectations, but also having a semi-abusive relationship with your parental figures. The madness and disassociation and depression that Yetu has remembering these painful memories, but why it's also so important to remember them. Resentment and loneliness and having a complicated relationship with the past, while also being hopeful, finding yourself to be part of a community and finding love and belonging. And these mermaids are so cool because they're deep sea predators, so they're never really described because our main character is one, so she doesn't think to describe describe themselves as anything. But every once in a while, you get a line and you're like, whoa, I have to recontextualize what I think about you. They have front fins, but also pointy teeth. And when they roar, like their whole face opens up. That was a, that was a line that tripped me up. But then also they're kind of like, a little gelatinous, or at least they need the pressure of the deep ocean to like keep them together. They swim with whales and they hunt sharks and they build these beautiful cities in the depths of the sea. This is the shortest of the list. This is only 155 pages. I flew through it in a day and a half and it did deal me emotional damage but it was worth it. Next up is another book that I read recently. This was in my last monthly wrap up and it sneaks in at 295 pages. This bleak feminist Shakespearean retelling has dark magic, brutal kings and dragons, the electric monstrosity that is Lady Macbeth by Ava Reed. If you couldn't tell from my shelves and just all around obnoxious personality, I was both an English major and a theater kid. So I read a lot of Shakespeare. Lady Macbeth is one of the fiercest villainesses of Shakespearean canon. And like, if there's anybody who's gonna guess like gatekeep and girl boss her way through making her husband the Thane of Cawdor, it's gonna be this bitch. But here we follow her roots as 17 year old Rocille as she is given in a political marriage to Macbeth. She has to leave the only home she's ever known and goes to this cold and distant court by the sea where she is trying to use her own strange magic to manipulate herself into a better life and better position as her husband starts going mad with his own ideas of power and she finds out there's more dark magic beneath the castle. Another dark and elegant gothic to add to your list, Ava Reed nails atmosphere like nobody's business. Now this is also pretty gruesome. There's body horror and lots of blood and torture sessions, both physical and psychological. It's unsettling, it's unnerving, and underneath every chapter is this slow creeping realization for the reader to find out in the final pages. Also, in my opinion, this super works as a Shakespearean retelling because we get the most famous plot points and we even get some of the famous lines, all hail Macbeth, Thane of Cawdor but we don't always get them as we expect them to be or in the order that we're used to them being in. So it kind of like switches it up and keeps it fresh. Also, she gave her a dragon. So that automatically makes this the best Shakespearean retelling ever. And the witches are probably my favorite part. I just realized now, I also read something similar in A Study in Drowning, which is also from Ava Reed. Ava Reed has a thing for like dark flooded basements. Super creepy, super weird. It's just kind of a book that makes you go, 
but like for every page, it's great. Now I know I hear you all saying, Rachel, that's enough with all this doom and gloom. Give me something more fun. I want something that's bright and colorful. It has like flowers and it's like whimsical. It has like cool ladies doing stuff and like fun, bright magic. So if you would like a sapphic story full of found family magic and love based on Guatemalan mythology, then you have got to check out The Name Bearer by Natalia Hernandez. Maybe I should not hold it where the type, do you see it? Are you seeing the book? Fun fantasy novels are so hard to come by nowadays, right? Because everything is grim and dark and gritty and like, hey, don't get me wrong. I love a grim, dark fantasy novel, but every once in a while, you just want to read about some hot ladies with swords and some magical flowers. For centuries, the court has employed a name bearer whose only purpose is to go to these magical flowers called the Flowers of Prophecy that will deliver the name of the next born ruler. But when our latest name bearer, who's a 10 year old girl, goes to the Flowers of Prophecy, they won't speak to her and instead deliver a prophecy that the one who was just born is not actually the ruler of the courts. But the king and queen are furious and refuse to believe this information and instead exile this young girl who then has to go and hide away in a sect of warrior women deep in the forest where then she grows up and she learns love and friendship uh, for a nice couple of years until this prophecy comes and hunts her down. And now she has been sent on this mission to go and find the actual true ruler of the kingdom. This sect of warrior priestesses name her Vanessa, which is butterfly. And we watch her grow and change from a young child into adulthood, which is why I don't count this as a YA. And like secret cult of warrior priestesses? Girl, where do I sign up? Like, yes, I get winded going up three flights of stairs, but like, we will figure something out. Let me in. Natalia is both Latinx and indigenous, and she puts so much love into crafting this world. It is so beautiful and so rich and vibrant. And the beginning of the book, when Vanessa first joins this priestesshood and she's going through the awkward stage of making friends and also maybe having a crush. And it gives me such nostalgia for books that I also read when I was around that age. There's a lot of characters in this book for it being only 200 171 pages long, but I love all of them. She's so good with dialogue and she's so good with introducing new characters, particularly kind of, we get two major characters introduced more than halfway through this book. And I grew to love them just as much as the people that we started off on page one with. I love Alaric and Rawl. Also, I very deeply relate to the gay panic of this book. I feel like this book was popular in a very specific niche of book talk, but if you haven't heard about it, if that circled in no overlap with your For You page, you gotta check this out. It's absolutely wonderful and Natalia is a delight. Next up, I'm breaking the rules a little bit because we're gonna talk about the only sci-fi book that's on this list, but that's also because this is my video and you know what? There are no rules. Now I love my space gays, my quantum queers, my floaty fruits. And I will say that most friend groups, you know, we have the crystal gay, we have the astrology gay, we have the tarot gay, but do you have a time traveling, dimension slipping, robo bio, robo girlfriend in the mix? I didn't think so. A beloved sapphic space opera that squeaks in in under 200 pages, you're welcome, is This Is How You Lose the Time War by Amal M. Otar and Max Gladstone. A book of love letters between two unlikely rivals who are both agents in a war that exists throughout space and time. Red belongs to The Agency, which is a futuristic post-singularity technotopia, and Blue, who is a bio-soldier who belongs to The Garden, which is a vast consciousness embedded in all organic matter. Basically, we have tech gay and plant gay. Though they are both agents fighting to take the other one down, they slowly begin to fall in love by leaving letters to one another throughout space and time. And this, these are all the letters that they leave to one another. So it's a really interesting way to set up a narrative. And of course, as the two of them grow closer together, the war is ramping up and they're trying to find a way to either destroy one another or run away. And because we don't give a shit about the bounds of linear time, these letters are found all over the place. At one point, I think Blue plants an acorn that grows into a tree that Red comes across a thousand years later and chops down and reads a message inside. And I think at one point, one of them puts a love letter in the DNA of a bee that goes and stings the other one. like. I gotta up my love letter game. Damn, I'm sending them by like Canada Post, like a schmuck. I want flowers from Cephalus and diamonds from Neptune. And I want to scorch the thousand earths between us to see what blooms from the ash so we can discover it hand in hand, content in context, intelligible to only one another. I want to meet you in every place I have loved. Oh my God. The way that stories and history and love are all interwoven in this beautiful, just short little love story. It may not be fantasy, but it is pretty fantastic. Oh, I'm so sorry, I'll leave. The next actual novella that I wanna talk about is from an author that you may know who has transitioned herself from YA powerhouse into novella writer extraordinaire, and that is Veronica Roth. Why did my voice just crack? 
Veronica Roth. I was first introduced to her novellas through Arch Conspirator, which I'm not including in this video because this is very purely dystopian sci-fi. This is a retelling of the Greek play Antigone. It's one of my favorites. I loved this book. And so when she came out with her next novella, I had Panic at the Disco, High High Hopes, and it's one of my favorite books now. And that is When Among Crows, which has an absolutely baller cover. I don't think the kids are using baller anymore, um, but I turned 29 this year and I'm really starting to feel the generational divide. But like, look at this and tell me that you're not already fully in love with this man. And our cover man is Demeter, who is part of a cult of monster slayers who split his soul to be able to create a sword out of his own spine. But he has a bargain to make, and so he recruits young Nightmare Ayla into helping bring him to Baba Yaga, with Ayla herself hoping to go to the matriarch of her people in order to get a curse that has been put on her bloodline removed. The nights of gritty downtown Chicago are mixed with this beautiful, enchanting, otherworldly fairy tale with themes of pain, sacrifice, friendship, and family legacy. Now, I love a dark urban fantasy, there is the world beneath our own type of book, and this is based in Polish folklore, so we get Zmora and witches and these kind of owl creatures and tree spirits and this weird holy order of saints. In this household, we love a witch mafia, we love an underground paranormal fighting ring, and we also love some magic queers, because surprise, it's gay. And as much as I love seeing the development of Peter and Ayla's relationship, I love Nico, who is introduced a little bit later. He's this kind of powerful being within the like witch mob community, but he is just an absolute delight and I'm so glad we get to see him messing around with things. Say what you want about the Divergent series, Veronica Roth has really grown into her writing. This book is beautiful, it's short, and yet it's jam-packed with grief and guilt and family legacy and curses and what it means to be a good person and myth and folklore. It's absolutely ethereal and you definitely should pick it up because it's only without acknowledgements, 163 pages. Oh no, there's a car reflecting light directly outside my window, so I'm getting the blinds shadows. Hold on. Okay, well now it's a bit darker, but at least I'm not getting blinded. Actually, this kind of thematically works for this next book because we are about to descend into madness. Obviously, as I upload this, it is September and October is right around the corner, though I would say spooky season is all year round. But this creepy sapphic vampire fantasy gothic is perfect if you want a new horror novel that is only 290 pages long. It is House of Hunger by Alexis Henderson. In a society where the upper echelons use blood as both power and medicine, none is more revered or more feared as the House of Hunger. Marion is a young woman who grew up in the slums and has no hope of leaving until she sees a ad asking for a blood maid for this mysterious house. She says yes, she goes on a cross-country road trip, and then she gets to this weird sinking gothic mansion in the middle of this gross-ass swamp, and uh, shenaniganery happens, and also it's gay. Countess and head of this dying house, Lisavette, is part of a debauched court, and Marion enters a vicious game in this hedonistic court as the Countess slowly becomes obsessed with her. Her, but also Marion is uncovering the secrets of the house and what lies beneath it. I don't know if this is supposed to be a direct Bluebeard retelling, but it definitely gives off that energy. To be a blood maid is to be expected to bleed for your mistress, and like Countess Lisevet has this health condition, so she's constantly drinking and injecting herself with other people's blood. She has these cool gold fingernail caps and these gold fangs that she constantly wears, so it's like vampire light. But the rules and expectations of this group of girls keeps changing, especially within their own hierarchy and like the jealousy and the obsession that they all have with one another and like being the top blood maid is really unsettling. And watching Marion's slow complacency is also so wild because when she gets there, she probably like the reader is like, the fuck is this? But then slowly kind of starts to buy into that lifestyle and buy into the bloodletting. And that's when shit goes off the rails. And while I get it, it's very easy to be seduced by a hot lady. Just the Countess just, for me personally, the couple of red flags. It's blood, it's desire, it's debauchery. It's full of lies and betrayal, and most of all, hunger. A beautiful and grotesque gothic, and is the perfect 288 page edition to any vampire shelf. On the complete other side of the spectrum, the next book we're talking about is an adorable, fun, silly, goofy, cozy fantasy that I read earlier this year. 
at some point, with 275 pages of determined princesses, silly little guys, and most importantly, dragons. It's I'm Afraid You've Got Dragons by Peter S. Beagle. Author of The Last Unicorn Fame, Peter S. Beagle is back with a new cozy fantasy set in the backwater kingdom of Belmontane, where they have a bit of a dragon problem. And our main character, Robert, is a dragon exterminator, but it's a career that he just inherited from his dead father, and he hates it with all of his heart. But Robert is hired by Princess Cerise to get the castle ready for her suitors as she's ready to marry, and there's gonna be princes coming from all the surrounding kingdoms kingdoms, and the castle is an absolute mess. It is infested with dragons, and we can't have that for the festivities. But when the absolute himbo that is Prince Reginald shows up, all three of them have an interesting friendship meet cute, if you will, and suddenly they're all drawn into this dragon quest that will bring them across the continent. If you like Monty Python or Princess Bride, this book is for you. It is so fun. Robert is this unlikely hero that has such amazing relationships with his friends, and Princess Cerise is like really coming into herself and realizing that she doesn't need a man, and like, no you don't girl, you're so fucking cool. And Reginald is just there doing his best. And the dragons of this are so adorable. The smaller ones are kind of like uber intelligent house cats. And Robert's knowledge of dragons means that he's just like spouting off fun facts all the time. So it feels like he just hired a dragon tutor. And then it gets even better when we learn a little bit more about his relationship and connection with dragons. No spoilers. <laughs> There's lots in here on camaraderie and friendship and kind of coming into yourself, realizing that you have more to offer than maybe people expect of you. It's light, it's funny, it's whimsical, and it has a great balance of comedy and fantasy, which I find is actually kind of hard just because comedic Writing good comedic fantasy can be really difficult, and this is, this one's great. And dragons. So, perfection. And lastly, my favorite on this list. And because she's my favorite, we're gonna let her break the rules a little bit because she's actually 301 pages, but she's so good that we're gonna let her get away with it. I didn't realize I had so many gothics on this list, but what can I say? Gothic fantasy is probably my favorite, and the very first book that I ever read of the genre that I fell in love with was Juniper and Thorn by Ava Reed. Oh, there's two books by Ava Reed on this list. Well, I guess I had enough caffeine to be funny, but not enough to remember people's names. This is a historical fantasy horror gothic retelling of the Juniper Tree, where our main character, Marlon Chen, is a young witch who lives with her two sisters and her tyrannical father in this old house in the edge of a city that is slowly modernizing. By day, the three sisters act as potion makers under the watchful eye of their father, but at night they all sneak out and would during one of these nightly dalliances, Marlon Chen comes across a young dancer for the new ballet and begins to fall in love. But as the trysts between lovers become more frequent, her father's rage and magic grows deeper and darker. Stuck between history and progress, blood and desire, Marlon Chen must embrace the monster within to be able to keep her sisters and her new love safe. We have Jewish folklore and these dark fairy tale patterns and this sharp twisted writing that I've come to love from Ava Reed. There's major horror of the body. There's a lot in here on eating disorders and becoming monstrous, watching your body change into something that you don't understand. There's a lot on binging and vomiting and characters eating in grotesque ways. And the way the characters interact with their world is interesting too, because it's almost like they realize they're in a fairy tale, the ways that things come in threes and curses come to fruition. I love a girl with a little darkness in her heart. And if you want something that is atmospheric and unnerving and grotesque, and honestly just a little gross, you're definitely gonna wanna take a bite out of this. There were the glass apples, which tasted sweet and made you wine flushed if you could bear to put those hard, sharp bits in your mouth. There were black amber plums, fat as bruises, which were suffused with a fatal poison. Our father had nurtured an immunity in his daughters by feeding us slivers of the fruit from the time we were infants, and now we could bite into the plums and taste only the tang of their rotted bitterness, not the poison beneath. And I do believe that is that on that. I'm drinking so much coffee today that I have not had any water, so grab a water, everybody. Let's stay hydrated together. I know I keep switching hands as to what hand is holding the sword, but honestly, it's because my wrists hurt. My wrist hurts, my back hurts, my neck hurts, my knee hurts. Oh, um, why does everything hurt? So there are 10 examples of books that show that you do not need 400, 500, 600 plus pages to make a good fantasy novel. As much as I love to sink my claws into some thick fantasy novels, that's gonna give me that dense world building that I love so much. Every once in a while, I just want a little quick read, a little whoop, little flash in the pan type of book. And here are 10 to maybe start you off with that if you're in a reading slump or you're behind on your Goodreads goal, or you just don't wanna have to pick up something that's gonna hurt your wrist every time. As always, please leave down below your favorite short fantasy novels and novellas. Because to be honest, maybe I entered into a bit of hubris when I changed my Goodreads goal from 80 to 99, uh, as I'm now behind on my own reading goal for the September. I might go lie down and oh, maybe I'll listen 
to the last like 45 minutes of the audiobook that I'm reading and maybe mentally prepare myself for dance class tonight, which maybe it's gonna be good. I'll get to like stretch out or something, but at the same time, like if I put my heels on and then like lie down, does that count as me going to class? You know where I clicked like the video, you know where I clicked to subscribe. I hope you guys are all having a nice day wherever you are and I will see you all next week. Bye.